Yes. Very good. Tell it to Jesus. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, we are glad to be here. Are you glad to be here? I think it's going to be a good time. We're, uh, we're going to see from the scripture, we're going to really um, zero in on the power of God. Uh, God's pretty awesome, guys. And so we're going to see his power. So we're going to sing some songs about his holiness and about just how awesome and great uh, God is. So we're going to start with holy, holy, what? Holy. holy. There we go. Let's stand together, all right? So let's sing it together. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. each other a little bit and we'll sing a little bit more okay Let's keep singing, though the darkness hide me. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. sin cannot molest near to the heart of God oh Jesus blessed redeemer sent from the heart of God hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of God, a place of full release. There is a place of full release near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless, redeem. 
sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Lord, we, uh, <clears throat> we thank You for Your heart. And Father, we, we know that You're a God of incredible um, power that is indescribable. Uh, we know that Your judgment Father, is, is always right. Uh, and we know, Lord, that this world uh, has rebelled against you in so many ways. And Lord, that we know that you're patient, we know that you're merciful, we know that you're gracious when uh, a part of your humanity says, Lord, um, I'm wrong and I've sinned against you. And I'm willing to come to you and repent and trust you as Savior of life but also yield to you as Lord. So, Father, um, thank you that you, you hear that repentant spirit and that you respond and that you give grace and you give forgiveness and you give life, Lord, to us. Uh, but we just thank you, Lord, that it's all about your heart. Uh, so we want to wait before you today. We want to be attentive to you today. Uh, we want to hear, Lord, the truth about who you are, that you are a patient God, but your patience, Lord, finally uh, has to give way to your righteousness and to your rightness. And so I pray that we'll have great respect for that today, that you'll work in our hearts and that you'll bring about a submissiveness and a yieldedness to you that uh, will lead us into those paths that you have designed for us. Bless your people today. We pray it in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Thank you all. And uh, <clears throat> you can come right on in. Um, this is a church where we lift up Jesus. We want you to connect with him. That's the most important thing. Uh, then we talk about being a family, and then we talk about that family being on mission. So we're really thankful today that, that we, uh, we see evidence all around us in this world that, that God is moving and that God is... is uh, bringing and drawing uh, hearts and lives to him. And so we pray today that you're certainly open to that. We just want to um, keep thinking today about how our God is the ruler. Uh, he's the rightful ruler of this world and that he reigns. And, and the most important thing in your life personally is to just make sure that he's reigning in your heart, okay? That he's ruling your heart and your life, that that's the most important personal uh, commitment and decision that you can make. So we're going to sing Our God Reigns. It's just a great little song about the gospel and about Jesus. So let's sing Our God Reigns. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Good news. Announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. Our God reigns, 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 our God reigns. All right, we're going to sing the second verse. Y'all, how many of you have ever heard that? Okay, all right. So not many of us have heard that. Okay, so uh, you have that little chorus, Our God Reigns. Uh, the second verse, uh, the second verse, I'll just be honest. I don't know if I get the words tucked in where they should go or not. Okay, it's a little bit awkward, but, this, but then the third verse is really good. But this is the second verse. Let's sing it together. Ready? He had no stately form, he had no majesty that we should be drawn to him. He was despised and we took no account of him, yet now he reigns with the most high our God reigns our God reigns our God 
God reigns. Our God reigns. Out of the tomb he came with grace and majesty. He is alive. He's alive. God loves us so. See here his hands, his feet, his side. Yes, we know. He's alive. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. I know you know this one, okay? Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning. And I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 11 and chapter 12. So we're going to be looking at some scriptures in those two chapters in just a moment. You know, there's four great eras of miracles in the Bible. And three of these have already transpired. One is yet to come. And during these periods, the eternal God has stepped into time and space with uh, incredible manifestations of his power. Uh, the first era of miracles came in the day, the days of Moses, and that's what we're studying this morning. The second in the days of Elijah, and then the third when Jesus himself walked on our planet as the God-man. One more era remains uh, yet in the future, and that is when God will visit this old earth with a series of devastating judgments on a world that has uh, by and large, rejected uh, his son and his word and his ways. It's interesting to me that it's in the first and the fourth era of multiple miracles. Moses and then the one that is yet to be are really heavy judgments upon the earth. And following each of these periods, there's a fresh era sort, that sort of dawns. You know, maybe a beautiful new life, previously maybe unknown by those people who lived through that time. So in the days of Moses, the Israelites who witnessed God's devastating power in these plagues that we're going to look at this morning, would enter into a new land uh, under a new leader to begin a new way of life as a nation. And in the future, those who turn to Christ and who endure whatever degree of tribulation that we might have to, will enter into an era of incredible peace and prosperity. Uh, the period of future judgment will lead into a brand new kingdom, kingdom life during which Jesus himself will serve as king. Yes, he will reign and he will rule as king of kings and lord of lords. God will forget neither his people nor his promises. Amen? God can never, never do that. So today we're going to survey these plagues and their effect on Moses and on God's people. And I want us to look at these under this umbrella of how faithful our God is and how God is faithful to provide for his people even through the plagues of life. These hardships that are brought upon the earth 
that can happen one after another. Uh, these plagues are, are not afterthoughts uh, in God's plan. Uh, they served as a part of his very deliberate strategy. And so you can go back to the burning bush, and we've studied that together in Midian. The Lord explained how this would all take place. Uh, and then again, while Moses was packing his bags for this long walk west, uh, a little later the Lord repeated uh, to his servant what the outcome of all this would be. And he made that very clear by saying, when you return to Egypt, Moses, see that you perform before Pharaoh all these wonders that I've given you the power to do. But even then, he said, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So God knew what Pharaoh's response would be. He knew the plagues that would follow. They were as much a part of his plan as the very calling out of Moses himself or even the Exodus itself. These plagues were just as much a part of God's plan. And uh, Pharaoh had said this uh, earlier, and uh, I want to remind you what Pharaoh said. Who is the Lord? Y'all remember that? Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I'm not going to let Israel go. And you know, when I read those words, I want to shout, Watch out! <laughs> Watch out, Pharaoh! You're in over your head. You don't even know what you're saying. You're talking about the God, the one true God, the God of heaven, who always has the final say. You better go with the flow, Pharaoh. You better go with God. But Pharaoh had a stubborn heart. And there's an old saying that you fight poison with what? Poison. And in, in other words, in order to deal with those who are stubborn and sort of bullheaded, uh, you have to be equally determined. And that's what God did. That's what God did with, with Pharaoh. The searcher of heart knows a hard heart when he encounters one. And Pharaoh's nature being what it was, the plagues were absolutely essential. So listen to me. God knows, he knows the exact same thing about all these world leaders that we hear about from time to time in our world right now. He knows the exact same thing about them and what he is going to have to do in all those situations to demonstrate to them that he alone is God. And you don't think that God... Can do that and God will do that God is going to do that even in our day so Moses asked the Lord a question and the question was simply how can I ever get Pharaoh to listen <laughs> Lord how can I get this man to listen to me and God's answer came in the form of these 10 plagues now how many plagues were there someone say 10 10 plagues be careful what you ask for, right? And uh, so here is how the Lord describes this. And uh, this is, if you want to follow along, that's great. In chapter 6, he said this, Go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, then why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? So Moses is protesting here. If the Israelites don't respect my message, then how in the world am I going to get this hard-headed king like Pharaoh to listen? And the Lord is saying, I'm so glad you asked, Moses. I just happen to have a few tools at my disposal. Don't worry about this. Don't worry. We're going to get Pharaoh's attention. And then the Lord of heaven, I'm going to tell you, church, rolled up his sleeves and started moving in on this stubborn heart of the king of Egypt. The whole nation suffered as a result of Pharaoh's callous response. So as your eye skims across the text that we're about to read, covering the plagues that shook the land, you're going to see the word, one word that you keep seeing here is the word all. All 
again and again, you see the word all. All the land, all the livestock, all the men, all the beast. And finally and tragically, we see the words all the firstborn. All the firstborn. So, ten plagues. When the Lord does a job, <laughs> I think we could say he does it really thoroughly, right? The plagues did not just trouble the elite of the court. They swept across the entire land of Egypt. And from beginning to end, Pharaoh maintained this mindset of stubbornness and resistance. For all of time, for all of eternity, I think this is the man in all the Bible who will be an example of what it means to resist the goodness of God, to reject God's goodness. And therefore, the Lord's decision was let the plagues begin. <laughs> Not let the games begin, but let the plagues begin. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to list these for you. And so I want you to get these. At one time, I had these memorized. As a young boy, I was in, uh, you know, I was in Sunday school, and we used to have to memorize Psalm 23 and the Lord's Prayer and, and the Ten Commandments and the Great Commission and all those kind of things. Well, one of the things we had to memorize were the plagues. I don't think I could say these in, by memory now, okay? But uh, I'm going to help you out. We're going to put these up on the screen. So let's just, let's just start with this. We'll say a few things about each one. So let's start with number one. This is the plague of blood. This is the water of the Nile being turned to blood. Now, you all know this. To every Egyptian, the Nile was basic to life itself. They depended on this body of water for all their, their water needs. So water for bathing, water for cooking, cleaning, Drinking, and on top of that, fish was uh, an, an, an Egyptian uh, sta staple uh, in their diet. So to strike uh, the Nile River uh, was to impact the very heart of the people's daily life, uh, even their diet, fresh water, fresh fish, and the king was not impressed about this plague at all. Uh, didn't even really uh, give it a passing thought. So number two was the plague of frogs. This was wall-to-wall -wall frogs. God help them, right? You know, frogs in the bread, frogs keeping them company between the sheets, uh, frogs in your clothes, frogs all over the kitchen. So you have frogs everywhere, and it's pretty hard to imagine. It was bad enough, you know, having one large frog, uh, you know, maybe move into the drain pipe as you have that to happen on occasions. What would it be like to have frogs in your cupboards, in the sink, uh, in your closet, in your bed? You walk down the hallway at night to get a drink of water and you crunch down on about a dozen of these frogs, you know? Uh, so frogs ruled the land. Now you would think, okay, that ought to do it. That ought to do it for Pharaoh, but it didn't. God was gracious. He not only turned the blood back into water of the Nile, but he took care of this frog problem, but with the pressure off, what did Pharaoh do? He just returned to his stubbornness. So number three, we got the plague of gnats. Gnats is a word that describes a very biting, uh, stinging insect that penetrates uh, all those places in your body that you just despise, your nostrils, your ears. It would be enough to just drive you crazy because these things were in your hair, they were down your neck, they were up your nose, they were in your mouth, they were in your eyes, in your ears, biting, whining, wheezing. But even with this, Pharaoh did not soften his heart. And at the end of this third plague, we see something that's very interesting, okay? Between this one and the fourth one, God intervened in an amazing way. And from the fourth plague on, the land of Goshen, where the Hebrews lived, had this invisible shield of protection around it. And from then on, from plague number four, God protected the Israelites while he continued to plague the Egyptians. So number four is the plague of insects. Let's write that in, the plague of insects, a swarm of insects. It means a mixture. So there's a great mixture here of, a, of different kinds of insects. So you got big flying beetles, you've got spiders dropping off the ceiling, uh, you've got fleas hopping all over you, 
Uh, you got ticks burrowing into your skin. You got chiggers crawling up your clothing, bees stinging you. The mixture of insects descended on Egypt by the multiplied trillions. Everywhere but, listen to this, Goshen, where the Hebrews lived. God was providing protection for them. And what was the result? Pharaoh what? Hardened his heart. Hardened his heart this time also. Number five, the plague on livestock. A lot of you have some livestock. So this was a pestilence on, uh, that, struck, that struck the cattle, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the goats, the sheep. Uh, so, but just over the Jordan, I mean, just over the border in Goshen, the Hebrews' livestock prospered. Their animals were not touched by this. They were not affected by this, never got sick. And so how clear could the evidence be to this? How clear could it be? And yet Pharaoh, his own one-man jury, declared the evidence not relevant, not relevant at all, and he hardened his heart. Number six is the plague of boils. Uh, by this time, the common person, I think, in Egypt had to be wondering what in the world is going to come next. What else could happen? And the Hebrew language here would suggest that these boils are inflamed uh, eruptions breaking forth into skin blisters. So these would have been what we would consider to be deep ulcer type things that kind of broke open with this stuff, you know, that just kind of ran onto the skin. But not, again, not on God's people. Not on God's people. God was providing a way for them. And then number seven, you've got the plague of hail. The hail would have finished off the remainder of the livestock that had maybe survived the fifth plague, anyone or anything out in the open would have been vulnerable since there was no ordinary, since this was no ordinary uh, hail uh, storm. Uh, this was hail that was powerful enough to just strip uh, the bark right off the trees. And once again, Israel enjoyed divine protection. No hail fell in Goshen, not a single hailstone, because God was providing a way, God had promised. Okay. Now, right here, we notice that the hail finally, listen to this, opened a little bitty crack in the heart of Pharaoh's hard shell of a heart. Just a little bitty crack. He makes this little speech right here, and it's a good, it sounded good. It sounded, it sounded like he was kind of really sincere. It sounded like he was repenting, but Moses didn't buy it. Moses didn't buy it. He knew that all Pharaoh was looking for was a back door to a bad situation and that he really hadn't truly repented at all. So Moses agreed to ask God to stop the hail, but he looked Pharaoh right in the eye and he says, but as for you and your servants, I know that you don't yet fear God. I, don't, I know that. And once again, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And the worst was yet to come. Number eight, this is the plague of locusts. And locusts here, it's starvation. Little by little, these plagues are attacking the basics of the Egyptian diet. So the locusts are stripping away every tree, every crop. Nothing is left. And you and I, we've seen, we've seen national type disasters. We've seen El Nino storms and mudslides and and droughts and tornadoes and hurricanes, the damage of, law, of, of life and the loss of life, we've seen that. That can be incredible. But this was a national disaster times 10. This was one of those rare moments in history when God stepped to earth in a specific way to judge his enemies. It had never happened to a, to a nation in this manner since the flood, and probably will not happen again until God says enough, and he sends to this earth the Lord Jesus himself with a, with a rod of iron to bring judgment to this world. The plague of locusts. Number nine is the plague of darkness. This is a very dark chapter in the history of Egypt. It's a dark chapter in some ways in Moses' life. But God's next action was to make that darkness literal. And that comes at the end of chapter 10. This was far blacker than the darkness of midnight. This was a darkness so thick that you could feel it. And uh, the Egyptians endured 
this ink black madness and they endured it for three solid days and three nights. So could Pharaoh's heart, the question is, we've, got, we've gone through nine of these, so the question is, could Pharaoh's heart still be hardened? Someone answer that. Yes. Yes. It could and it was. And this finally led to the dramatic confrontation. And here's where I want us to pick this up together. So in your Bible, look at Exodus 10, verse 28. I had you turn to 11, but let's just look at 10, at the very end of 10, verse 28. And let's look at this confrontation that's described in this verse. This is Exodus 10, verse 28. It says, Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. And that is the way it turned out. Aside from the uh, prediction that Moses is going to give to him of the final plague, Moses never saw Pharaoh's face uh, again. Now, before we go to this last plague, and the last plague is the death of the firstborn. Y'all know that, okay? So before we go there, Listen, even in the midst of life's hardships for you, even in the midst of life's plagues, plagues that are sometimes due to someone else's hardness of heart, right? But not always. Sometimes plagues and hardships are, are inexplainable. But listen to me, even then, God is still working, right? He's still working and He's still working providing. I think when it, especially when it comes to God's judgment due to the hardness of human hearts, listen to me, I think he does a really thorough job of it. He does a thorough job. And it is, listen to this, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen? I hope not, but perhaps you have shoved aside essential truth for so long that your heart has become hardened. And I'm going to tell you, the longer you harden your heart, the more difficult it's going to be to allow God's light to finally break through. Finally break through. And if that doesn't describe you, then give God praise for that. Because God is to be praised. But we all know people who have placed themselves in such a situation. They have rejected appeals. They have ignored sermons. They have set their hearts against warnings. They have scoffed at God's word. They have stiffened their necks to go their own ways. And here's the truth. Something that sits too long under the light of the sun becomes hardened to the sun. Y'all know that? So you stare at the sun long enough and you're going to become blinded by the light of that. So in other words, if you don't respond, and that's why I say it's a dangerous thing that you come on Sunday mornings. Okay? It's dangerous. Because if you don't respond to it, listen to me. Ultimately, you're going to be ruined by it. And it's not, it doesn't have a thing to do with me. It has everything to do with God's word and God's truth. And that's the way it was with Pharaoh. If you don't respond to it, if you don't yield to it, it's going to ultimately ruin you. So a day of reckoning finally arrives. And it's a fearful thing to tread underneath your foot the mercy and the grace and the love of God. Now, there's a bright side to this, and I want you to write this in, because when God blesses, you know what he does? He holds nothing back. And aren't we glad of that? Amen? That when God blesses, God holds nothing back. And that's the way it was with the children of Israel. That's the way it was with God's children in the land of Goshen. As dark as it had become in Egypt, the Hebrews in Goshen, they were flooded with light. They were a city on a hill. They were shining through the night. If only Pharaoh had eyes to see it. So you may be one, and I've said this before, I am one who has really enjoyed through my life, I've enjoyed God's great grace. And God's favor has been upon me big time. His protection, His provision, His daily blessings, 
his unmerited favor upon my life. And what I try to do, I'm not perfect, but what I try to do is I try to just say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. And you can thank God. That's part of worship. You can thank God for a place in the land of Goshen that maybe you're enjoying right now. And if that's you this morning, enjoy it. Without any guilt at all, enjoy the blessings of God. Enjoy God's protection. Because believe me, nothing in this life or the next life is more serious and sobering than the wrath of God. Nothing is more serious. And some are graciously broken by that wrath. And again, it wasn't due to me, but I'm just so grateful for the work of the Holy Spirit that broke my heart over the wrath of God and led me to say, Jesus, you be my Savior and you be my Lord. And today, that could be the day for you. Today could be the day for you where you say, I want that. I want that brokenness. I want the Lord Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Life's plagues are hard to endure. But God has no desire to leave us alone in our pain, in our distress. Habakkuk was the guy who once cried to God, Even in your wrath, God, remember mercy. Even in your wrath, remember mercy. And the Lord has done just that because in Jesus, God showed us that he is faithful and he's our ever-present friend. So this one last plague is the plague of the firstborn, the death of the firstborn. We're going to read it. Uh, but let me tell you this. Let's write this in first. The main point of Exodus 11 and 12, as I go through, as I've read through these chapters multiple times, the main point of these two chapters is obedience. That is by far and away the main thing. God spoke. Some people heard and they did what God said. And as a result, God used them in his plan at that time in history. And really, that is the bottom line of life, is listen to God, respect God, obey God, and then leave the results to him. That's life, folks. That's why you're here. That's why you're on this earth, is to listen to God respect God, obey God, follow Him, and then leave the results to Him. So let's see how this obedience thing takes shape in Exodus 11. You follow along. Exodus 11, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, I'll bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Now, doesn't that strike you as a little strange? The Hebrew slaves were to ask for silver and gold from their Egyptian neighbors as they left? Why? Well, you know, the Israelites didn't realize it at this point, but God was getting them ready for a trip. And the silver and the gold were sort of like a withdrawal from an ATM machine on their way out of town. Y'all ever done that? Need a little cash? So you just stop by an ATM machine and get a little cash? So this was only a little meager payoff for over 400 years of slave labor in Egypt. God had something in mind. Does God always have something in mind, church? Always. God had something in mind that no one had ever, ever dreamed of. You know what it was? The tabernacle. The tabernacle was going to go through them, with them, all through that 40-year wilderness. The tent of meeting where the Israelites would meet in close proximity with this awesome, holy God who had delivered them. So I want you to listen to this. In the midst of life's plagues, God has something already in mind. God didn't tell them why they would need those precious metals. He just said, ask for them. Ask for them. And they did. You know what that's called? Obedience. They just did what God asked them to do. Verse 3, the Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people. 
And Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people themselves. So Moses was greatly esteemed by the by the Egyptians themselves. Why was that true? I think because Moses was a strong leader. He stood alone. He trusted God. He fully obeyed God. And I think it just says here, the Lord granted him favor. We don't always know why God does this, but God granted him favor in their eyes. And the Lord delights to do that. So after Moses had been told, you have found favor, Moses, in the eyes of the people, Moses had this one last interview with King Pharaoh. And in the course of that highly charged conversation, Moses announced five things to Pharaoh which the king promptly rejected. Was that any big surprise? (laughs) Not a surprise at all. What were those five things? The five things were something's going to happen at midnight tonight. Something's going to happen. All of Egypt's firstborn is going to what? Die. There will be national distress Israel is going to be protected. And Pharaoh, there will be an exodus. That's what Moses told him. Moses told him something's going to happen at midnight. All of Egypt's firstborn is going to die. There will be national distress, despair. Israel's going to be protected. And finally, there will be an excess. The time, listen to this, the time of God's patience was past. And the pronouncement of impending judgment, it was severe. It was as if to say, Pharaoh, you have withstood the God of this universe long enough. You've dared him to act, (laughs) and boy, act he will. I want you to picture in your mind's eye right now, a godly Hebrew family as they hear Moses repeat God's instructions. And those instructions are this. Take a lamb, one per family, cut the throat of that lamb, drain the blood out of that lamb. You're to keep some of that blood and then with a hyssop branch, you're to dip in that pan of blood and you're to smear it on the doorpost of your front door on each side. And while you're at it, I want you to smear some of that blood on the, they call it the lintel. It was the horizontal beam just above the doorway. On the lintel and the doorpost. Those are the only places that I want you to put some blood. Now, if you had heard that for the very first time, what logical reason was there for doing something like that with the lamb's blood? I think you would probably say there's no logical reason. The only reason that I would ever do that is that God told me to do it. And if that is your response, you're exactly right. And at this point, that's the only reason that they needed. God, in his unfathomable wisdom, designed a plan that required only one thing from his people. What was it? Obedience. Just obey me. He never asked them to think it through. He never asked them to pray about it. He never asked them to dialogue about it. He never asked them to consider the idea and then decide if they agreed with it. He simply told them what to do, when to do it, and then he told them what would happen as a result of their strict obedience to his his word. So go, go with me to chapter 12. Let's go over to chapter 12 and look at verse 12. So this is Exodus 12, verse 12, 12, 12. On that same night, he says, I will pass through Egypt and I will strike down every firstborn of both people And animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. You notice that? Little g, all the gods, little g of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood is going to be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, listen to this, I will what? 
I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So God told them, I'm going to visit Egypt. Tonight I'm going to invade every dwelling where there is no blood on the door. And there will be blood on the doorways of my people and they will be spared. That's my plan, God says. That is the plan. Just do the plan. And from that significant day all the way to the present day, y'all know this, the Jewish people remember, what do we call it? Passover. Passover. History was made that night. And it was made because the people of God believed God's man and they obeyed God's plan. Now the Lord went on and gave them even more Detail in verse 25, this is Exodus 12, 25. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, I want you to observe, he says, this ceremony. And when your children ask you, well, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then you tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the, the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and they worshiped God. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. This is a part of the story that I guess my nostalgia uh, part of me kind of comes out because those of us who are parents and those of us who are grandparents, we have this very important assignment of helping our offspring grasp the meaning of why we do what we do. And I know that Debbie and I have been there dozens of times, and we hope that we're there dozens of more times. And we relish those opportunities to pass on to our children, to our grandchildren, the things of God. The instruction that Moses gave was to be passed along, listen to this, from generation to generation to generation to generation. After he finished with these specific instructions, the scriptures say that the people bowed low, they worshiped God, and then the sons of, uh, of, of uh, Israel, they did, they did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And we're back to that main response of life, and that is obedience to God. Obedience to God. Say that with me. Obedience to God. The way I see it, the theme that just beats like a pulse through all of this scripture is obedience, obedience, obedience. It's like a pulse that just beats. Obedience to God. Pharaoh, did Pharaoh obey God? Pharaoh did not obey God. And he would not. And as a result, he exposed both himself and his entire nation to the judgment of God. The Hebrews, they heard the Lord's word. And through Moses, they did obey. Right down to the smallest detail. And as a result, they experienced the greatest deliverance. That except for the deliverance that we get, when we come to faith in Jesus, there's not been a greater one. They made history. Pharaoh became history. And here is my personal conviction, all right? Here is my pastoral word to you today, is that our greatest struggle, and you've heard me say this before, our greatest struggle is not in the realm of understanding the will of God. Our greatest struggle is in the realm of doing the will of God. That is my struggle, is I'm not doing what I know to be true. Our problem is not that we don't know. Our problem is that we are not doing what we do know and we're just not willing to endure and follow through. Listen, you will always be glad you obey God. Are you hearing me? You will always regret that you disobeyed God. Oh, you'll enjoy, you know, because the Bible says the pleasures of sin are for a short time. They are there for a short time. But over the long haul, you will always regret not obeying God. So 29, verse 29, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, firstborn of all the livestock, 
Pharaoh and all of his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, just get out of here. Worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and, oh, by the way, also bless me. Through all these plagues, God was working, and God was providing. And you know what God is doing here this morning? God is working right here in our midst. Listen to me. We're done. God is working in your life to get you out of Egypt, to get you out of those places of bondage where sin is reigning and ruling in your life. God is working to get you out of there. And maybe the way to say it is that God is working to get the Egypt out of you. To get the bondage and that slavery to sin. To get that out of your heart. And to get you right smack in the middle of his will for you to follow him. That's what God is doing this morning. Maybe you'd like to come and say for the very first time, I want Jesus to be the ruler and the reign of of my life and my heart. And I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to give him that rightful place of lordship in my life. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe as a believer, maybe you have places in your life or a place in your life where to this point you've been a little resistant, you've been a little stubborn. And today is the day to lay it down and to find that sweet release that we just sang about. You see, through this story, God is still working today, and God is still moving. And he's working to get you out of that place of bondage and to get that bondage out of your heart. Amen? Let's bow. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you'd like to come in just a moment. I'm going to stand down here at the front, and all you have to say is, I I want to be in the very center of God's will. And if you're serious about that, if you're serious about, Brother Tim, I really want to be in the center of God's will, then he may tell you, you know, you're right where you you need to be. You're right where I want you to be. So just trust me. Keep on keeping on. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to use you. But then again, in the life of the believer, he might just say, now that I've got your attention, (laughs) I want to use you in the place of my choosing. And what I'm asking you to do, this is God speaking, is keep your sandals on because you're getting ready to travel really light. Let's go make some history. And that might just be where some of you are today. Would you just say, I'm willing to go, God. I'm willing to go. It all comes down to obedience. Obeying the Lord. Father, we thank you today that the Lord Jesus came to break the power and the grip of sin through forgiveness, but through also a change of heart. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that comes to live inside of us, that gives us these new desires and these new longings to love you and to follow you and to obey you. But Lord, today we're just here to celebrate and give you thanks for you being a God that provides a way if we're just willing to trust you and if we're willing to follow you. So I pray right now that we're willing to do that. I pray that this this great hymn that we're about to sing, that we'll just fall in step with you and that we'll be those good Christian soldiers marching uh, to your leadership, marching to the place that you want us to be. Help us to do that now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Onward Christian Soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war.
to come and continue to uh, learn about you and learn to trust you, Lord. We want to thank you for Brother Tim. Thank you for this church, Lord, and these people. Bless each and every one of them, please. Also, Father, we're thankful that we're looking at green grass in July, Lord. We thank Amen. you for the rain. Amen. Uh, be with us as we take up the offering that it's used to further your work, Lord. As these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated, and while the offerings pass, let's sing, worthy, you're worthy, holy, you're holy, and Jesus, you are Jesus, King of kings. Here we go. Worthy, you are worthy, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy, worthy, you are worthy. King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. Holy, here we go. Holy, you are holy. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are holy. Holy, you are holy. King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. Jesus, here we go. Jesus, you are Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are Jesus. Jesus, you are Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. Amen. All right. 
right. So on your bulletin today, just note the calendar up there at the top. Uh, we're pretty slim during the summer. We're still kind of in our summer schedule. So we do have church tonight at 6, so join us there. And then Wednesday night at 6.30, we have uh, Bible studies there for you. Uh, our building fund uh, continues to do well. We had a good Sunday last Sunday. And uh, so we're trying to reach that 100000 to match that that really generous gift that's come, that's come in here recently to our building fund. We're going to try to do that by Thanksgiving. And so to date, we've given like 6,484. So uh, all of us just uh, continue to pray and continue to follow the Lord's leadership uh, with this. Two dates that we want you to put down, August the 25th, that's a Sunday. That's a special in-gathering Sunday. So we'd like that Sunday to really uh, bring in... Um, some good cash for our building fund. So you might be praying right now about what you bring on August the 25th. And then on Saturday, September 28th, we're going to have a special auction over at the community center. And we'll be sharing a little bit more uh, details with you about that. We have a team that's going to be starting to work on that in about a week or so. And so uh, just put those dates, though, on your calendar, August 25, September 28th. Uh, we do have some new designs back here uh, across from the first kitchen uh, cabinet uh, or the, the uh, serving uh, bar there. So uh, note those, that they're on a little bulletin board. Still a work in progress, but uh, we think that we're, we're getting closer, you know, to really truly what the Lord has in store for us. So look at those and um, any questions that you have on that, ask Rob back there. <laughs> Uh, that's, a, that's a good person to ask. Okay, um, we have a, an associational uh, gathering every quarter. This is our Brad, Brad, uh, Brazos Valley Baptist Network. And uh, this quarter, it's going to be uh, not this Tuesday, but Tuesday, August the 6th, over at Living Hope Baptist Church in College Station. And uh, Dr. Katie uh, McCoy is going to come and share on this topic of transgenderism and the impact that it's having on today's youth and families. And so I think this is going to be a really strong uh, quarterly gathering. If you're interested in going to that, I do need to know of your uh, interest because I need to register you, okay, and let them know. It's 1130 to 1 Living Hope Baptist Church on Tuesday, August the 6th. Uh, the Aggie uh, BSM great giveaway, there's still some flyers down here if you want to participate in that. I know that they would really appreciate this, an outreach to our international students. Shepherds training, uh, if you're already on that safety team, uh, you're going to have training Saturday, August the 10th from 8 to noon in the Fellowship Hall. If you're interested in serving on this team, that would be a great time to come and to get a little bit more information on that. Uh, then the back-to-school luncheon on uh, Monday, August the 12th. We're looking forward to um, welcoming our uh, Iola ISD teachers and staff and administrators there on uh, that Monday uh, back here in our fellowship hall. If you are willing to make some homemade ice cream, here is a little sign-up that we need uh, your name. So if you're willing to make some homemade ice cream, that's probably the, the favorite thing that the teachers love uh, to have. So if you would be willing to make a gallon of that, please come here and sign uh, that. Also, um, food pantry. Remember the food pantry this month, even though we've, we just had it about a week ago, this, this one coming up in August is really important because of school starting. We really need a lot of cereal, a lot of dry cereal, okay? So if you could start kind of thinking about that and you've got, you've got some time to bring that to the fellowship hall and we'll scoop it up and get, get it in the right place. Uh, but we really could use a lot of dry cereal. While you're at it, canned chicken and jelly work good too, okay? And You want me to keep going? I can tell you all <laughs> kinds of things. But we know what the people uh, like and, and, and so forth. T-shirts are back here uh, again on that little kitchen serving area. Uh, we're offering the T-shirts, the caps for $10 a piece. That will go to the building fund. So if we could help you with that, that would be great, okay? All right. Boy, I've got a couple of 
uh, young ladies today that uh, are going to come. And uh, so, Abilene, once you come first, this is Abilene Willis. We love Abilene, don't we? And Abilene wants to come and just share with us that she's prayed to receive Christ. And she just wants to love him. She wants to follow him. She wants to obey him. And uh, so part of that is baptism. So she wants to be baptized. She's professing her faith in Christ today and is saying that she wants to be baptized. So let's clap for Abilene, okay? <laughs> Abilene, we love, love you. Okay, stay right there, okay? And then this is Bailey. Bailey, this is Bailey McNeil. And Bailey wants to share with you the same thing, Okay that she has trusted Christ as her Savior. She wants to follow Him. She wants to do what God wants her to do with her life. And so we're going to baptize her too. So let's clap for Bailey, all right? All right, stay right here. All right. Okay, so uh, we want you to come by and, and uh, greet these two young ladies and just tell them how proud you are of them. Sharon, why don't you stand here? And Lindsay, why don't you stand with Abilene? Let's stand together and let's sing one more verse of how great thou art when Christ shall come. Okay, here we go. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Love you guys, y'all come. Okay. Good job. Good job. Good job. 